So I'm talking to Daniel and Sari um, at the MathConnex conference. Um, in your talk, there's some, I learned something, even though I heard you speak, speak before, I think I heard something really came home today. You said that young kids, when they look at quantities of dots, for instance, and, and say which is more and which is less, that's a skill we share with animals even. They, they can do those kind of discriminations. You're finding in your research that um, when kids have deficit and deficits in that area, the mo it really shows up long term if they have a, if they're reading symbols like you say seven and nine, which is bigger. Um, if they have problems there, you see kids generally don't do as well long term as kids who can do that more automatically. It's not in the dot discrimination; it's more in the numbers. And recognize numbers, and it's it's in the transition from concrete things or representations to the symbols that kids start to start to have problems, and that we really need to be looking there. Uh, it's not always in a concrete understanding; it's understanding math as a symbolic system. And I, I think, from my experience, that's that's where we need to focus more in education, because a lot of these systems are cultural; they're developed. We we don't. Um, they're not natural to us always, these, and uh, I think to catch kids who are struggling, you really need to look at deficits there. Is that? Yeah, exactly. I, I completely agree, and that's what at least our data shows. There, there, I should say that there is data out there suggesting that even dot discriminations are correlated with math skills, so there's various groups that have shown these relationships. But in our data, the thing that falls out most consistently is the symbolic uh, uh, level uh, deficit. And so, remember I showed some data from a large sample of dyscalculic children between grades 1 and 6 mm -hmm. and the most consistent thing that differentiates them from typically developing children, children with no impairment in arithmetic is really their ability to rapidly compare which of two Arabic digits is larger, not necessarily the dot array. So, right. exactly like you said, what we're concluding from that is that we we don't think that these skills that we share with animals are necessarily at the heart of math deficits, right. but that it's more in, in, in sort of re, I would say recapitulating human culture within the individual development, right? right? right. Because every individual child needs to basically uh, under, reinvent or understand the uniquely human cultural inventions, those numerical symbols. And once, once they've got a fluid understanding of those symbols, relationships, how they relate to quantity and relate to one another, then that gives, gives them a, a very good scaffold. At least that's what the data that we're finding seems to suggest. Right, and I've, I've seen that I think in older kids. Um, for instance, kids who don't have a great sense of numbers. You know, I've, I've worked with kids who struggled to do math who, who couldn't tell you what pairs of numbers add up to 10. But when they learned those things, they could start to make predictions if there were some hidden things, they, and they knew there were 10 all together, and they saw how many they could see, they could predict it was hidden. For the first time, they started seeing numbers and being able to break numbers into smaller numbers. And I could have worked with them endlessly with the concrete materials, so they just couldn't see the relationships or how to decompose numbers into smaller numbers until they knew the symbol system and which, which pairs of numbers go together, which ones add up, until they knew the fact families and so on. So would you, would you think that's probably true of a lot of uh, elementary math, that, that it's, we can't just focus on the concrete and the models. We need to uh, show kids how to move from the model to more abstract or symbolic representation. Would you say that's likely? I, I would say that's very likely. And I would also say that we underestimate perhaps how complex it is to understand number symbols. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have a verbal label. Mm -hmm. They have uh, a quantity that's associated with them, right. and they have relationships to one another right. in very complex ways. Right. So sometimes I think we assume too much that children come into elementary school knowing these things when they really don't. Mm -hmm. And if they don't know these things or don't have a very fluent understanding, how are they going to learn arithmetic? How are they going to learn to manipulate those symbols? So maybe there's, there's somewhat of too stark a break where, you know, preschool it's about manipulatives, it's... Um, it's, it's very free, and then we get into this highly constrained symbolic realm of math, and that transition may be causing some children real difficulties. Right. And uh, sorry, with your research, what do you see about for future directions, and, and maybe what 
and the implications for the school system of the kind of things you hope to look at? Well, I think one of the implications is that we can start to uh, go earlier in, in kindergarten and, and look at what competencies children have, that sort of their preparedness to go into the elementary school classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that has happened in reading uh, mm -hmm. because people have identified core building blocks for reading right. and have developed really great programs for, for strengthening those core competencies early on and thereby ensuring that the developmental trajectory is going to be one that's going to be smooth and that children can build on solid foundations. I think in math we haven't done that so much mm -hmm. and I think with the research that's coming out we're, 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 we're getting a better understanding of these foundational competencies, how to uh, assess them and eventually also how to then go in and target children who may be lacking some of these foundational skills rather than finding that out uh, much later because I talked to some teachers here today who were saying that they've got kids in their seventh grade classroom who don't have a good understanding of, of Arabic numerals and how they relate to one another. And by that right. time, how do you achieve that catching up? So it has to right. be at the beginning to, to allow that cumulative process to evolve. I'm not saying it's the only thing, but it's one important component, I think. So in reading, I, I guess the research suggested that being able to understand phonics or, or recognize phonemes and things like that to break words into sounds and, and into parts. They didn't know how important that was uh, until recently and now there's evidence that kids need those basic skills and that you can build them and so you're hoping we'll find similar things in mathematics? Yes, exactly. I mean there's really been a revolution in reading research through the discovery of these building blocks and people debate about them but nobody would say there is that the, 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 this idea that you have building blocks which determine how good you're going to learn subsequently. I think that's that's a done deal in reading. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, we're hoping to find some of these predictors in math, though I don't think the analogy between reading and math can only go so far, mm -hmm. because there are some aspects to math that are fundamentally different, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, perhaps the upper level of complexity is much greater in math than the upper level complexity in reading mm -hmm. to some extent. Um, and so, yes, I, I do think we're getting to that stage where we're starting to have some of the analogies to what's happened in the reading field. And we can certainly borrow from them as well, the kinds of approaches that they've taken and, um, you know, the kinds of debates that have emerged in that field and, and try to learn from that as well. And, I mean, I'm an amateur in this, in, in this area, um, but it seems from what I've read that, that this is part of a, this recognition is part of a general trend that, um, all, in all areas of cognitive science, when, when scientists look at how people become experts, they're realizing that it's important to bring, build, to break challenges into smaller manageable challenges, to build up fundamental skills and concepts, and, and the higher level concepts only emerge out of that kind of basic building blocks, that practice is important to consolidate ideas and, and, and skills. Uh, and that seems to be more and more generally established in cognitive science, and, and that it, I think that message has to get into education that these abilities don't come out of nowhere. You're not just born gifted. <laughs> you can train these abilities and nurture them if you do it in a manageable way for students. Absolutely. Is that an accurate read of I would I would agree with that, and that's why I think that the insights from developmental cognitive psychology and to some extent developmental cognitive neuroscience are so critical for informing education because they really teach us the sequence by which certain skills develop mm -hmm. and and really taking that developmental perspective mm -hmm. into account that, that things are not stable but they're dynamically changing and mutually informing one another and, and this idea of you know constructing representations at both the level of the mind and the brain and understanding what are the scaffolds and how do different skills build upon those scaffolds and what happens when you lack those scaffolds, how can you go back and reconstruct the process, if you like. Yeah, it seems that's, that's very promising, I think, for education. And um, we we're so excited to have you here today uh, to give us an, an insight into those, those new developments. So My thank pleasure. You so much. Thanks, John. Thank you.